We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, so we've been going through the book of Daniel and we're gonna wrap it up today. And some of you may be thinking, well, Daniel has 12 chapters in it and we've gotten through Daniel chapter six. <laughs> so you're right, we're gonna go through seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 today. So buckle up, all right? We're gonna go quick. We got a lot to cover. Daniel is actually kind of split into two parts. The first part of Daniel, first six chapters, are stories about Daniel and his friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we kind of been going through those together. The last half, the part we're going and covering today in an overview format, is all the prophecy, uh, the, uh, not all of it, but a lot of the prof prophetic parts of Daniel are what we're going to cover today. And really kind of one of the things we have to know first is what is prophecy, when we say Daniel is a prophetic book, it's a prophecy book, what do we, what do we mean by that? And prophecy, simply put, is essentially kind of when somebody receives a message from God that is meant to be shared with other people, we'd call that prophecy. So God reveals something to Daniel, and then Daniel, as a prophet of God, shares that with the people who need to hear it, God speaking through him. And the way it works, for the most part, for Daniel, is God is actually revealing to Daniel something that's going to happen in the future, something that hasn't happened yet. How many of you have been to a parade before? You've been to a parade. Uh, some of you love parades. Some of you, maybe you've only been to a couple because you don't really enjoy them all that much. But here, here's what I want you to understand. Uh, a, a parade illustration will help you understand prophecy dealing with the future, because Daniel is standing at a certain place in the parade, all right? And there are floats, as time is passing by, there are floats that are kind of crossing in front of him. As, and, and for example, you all know what yesterday looked like because you were there, right? So that float has already gone by. Well, imagine if there was someone at a different spot in the parade, somewhere maybe at the beginning of the parade, and they've already seen the mayor's float. And it's amazing. It's phenomenal. Way better than last year. So they run ahead over to you, and you're over here, and the mayor's float is still over there, and they're saying, oh, just wait until you see the mayor's float. It's incredible. You're, man, you're in for a surprise. They already know what's coming. They're just have been at a different point in the timeline. Well, Daniel has this incredible ability that God's given to him as a prophet to, to see some things that are coming before they arrive in front of him. Now, a lot of the floats that we're going to hear about today, some of the prophetic things that are about the future, these are floats that have already passed by us. These are things that have already happened. When, the, when Daniel received these visions, these are things that had not happened yet, but that were going to happen in the future. But a lot of the prophecy are things that have already happened. So we're going to be giving you a real quick overview of a lot of things today because I want to make sure that we take away something and I don't just, you know, open a fire hydrant on you, okay? So we're going to overview a, a few things. The first chapter uh, that we're going to look at is chapter 7. So grab a copy of God's Word. Open up to Daniel chapter 7, and uh, we're not going to read a lot. I'm just going to tell you what's in there so that when you go home later this week and you read Daniel chapter 7, you'll know what you're looking at, all right? So Daniel chapter 7, it opens up where Daniel receives a vision, and he receives a vision while Babylon is still in the major world power. The Babylonian Empire, Daniel, remember, has been taken out of Jerusalem, and he's a, a basically a, a, in, in Babylon, Babylon and, and, and this vision that he receives. Well, this vision, in it, there's these four beasts, these four things that look kind of scary and, and weird that he sees in this vision. One of them is a lion with wings. The second one is a bear with ribs in his mouth. And then he sees this winged leopard with four heads. 
Okay? And then the fourth thing that he sees in this vision is this big, monstrous, terrible beast that's stronger and more powerful than all the rest that has these horns, these ten horns on his head. And so you, you hear about this vision. And I don't know about you, but if I woke up one day after receiving a, a, having a dream like that, I would quickly wonder, what did I eat last night? Like, what was it? So I can avoid it. Or maybe think I need to stop, you know, watching whatever show I was watching right before bed because it did something to, you know, whatever. It's a pretty odd vision. This vision of these, these, these beasts coming up out of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, one of the things, that I, again, I'm just going to give you a brief thing. This is a vision that Daniel received about something that was going to happen in the future that hadn't happened yet for Daniel, but it's already happened for us. Historians can now look back and know exactly what each of those beasts represent. I'm going to tell you quickly so you don't have to wonder, but the first beast, the, the king with the, the wings, that actually represents uh, the winged lion, uh, re- represents the Babylonian empire. So Daniel was living in that moment. He's, in fact, the winged lion was actually a motif of the Babylonian empire. So it represented the empire that he was currently living in. And then this bear comes in, and the bear represents the Medo-Persian empire, which was going to take over the Babylonian empire. And sure enough, in history books, we can go back and see that that's exactly what happened, right? It actually happened in Daniel's lifetime. And then we have this four-headed leopard, which is the Greek empire, The Grecian Empire essentially comes in and they become the world power. Alexander the Great, we're going to hear about him in just a moment. Alexander the Great comes in and and we we hear about this, this leopard, right? This Grecian Empire is this leopard with four heads. Well, do you know that when Alexander the Great died, right? This really powerful king died. He divided his kingdom amongst four generals, and you can go in the history books and see how, how those four generals kind of that, that empire got divided. But then there's this other beast, this terrible beast, and it represents the Roman Empire. And you're going to see that this terrible beast is unlike any of the other beasts, even the way it's described. It's not described in any sort of way that we can understand. We, we don't understand. We understand what a lion looks like and what a leopard looks like. We can picture a leopard with four heads. But this terrible beast with ten horns, and it's kind of like, what does that look like? And, and the reason why it's so different is that the Roman Empire was bigger and more powerful, stronger, unlike anything the world has ever seen. Essentially, it was indeed different than all the others. For almost a thousand years, the Roman Empire dominated the earth. So that's what we see in chapter 7. We get to hear about a vision that Daniel received of floats that were coming in the parade in the future that have already passed by him, or not already passed by him, have already passed by us. We've already seen these things happen. The crazy thing, though, is that we see uh, Daniel's vision has a lot of kind of very specific things, even like that four-headed leopard where historians can all look back, Uh, not only historians but theologians, there's pretty much no disagreement about what this vision was about. And and now I've shared it with you, chapter 7. Then chapter 8, all right, a chapter 8 overview, Daniel receives another vision, and this is again, while Babylon is still in charge of things, right? So this is about something in the future for Daniel that hasn't happened yet, and he gets this other vision. I'm going to share this vision with you in Scripture. Daniel chapter 8, let's go uh, the first, uh, verses 2 through 4. It's, uh, Daniel says, In this vision I was at the fortress of Susa in the province of Elam, standing beside the Ulai River. As I looked up, I saw, and by the way, Daniel's actually at this place. He, he looks up, and on the side of the river, he sees something that nobody else can see. He gets this vision, okay, of this ram with two long horns standing beside the river. One of the horns was longer than the other, even though it had grown later than the other one. The ram butted everything out of its way to the west, to the north, and to the south, and no one can stand against him or help his victims. He did as he pleased and he became very great. So again, a very weird thing to see while you're out at the river. He sees this this picture. But then it goes on in verse five. He says, while I was watching, suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly, (laughs) listen to this, so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. His goat, or this goat, which had one very large horn between its eyes, 
headed toward the two-horned ram that had been standing beside the river, rushing at him in a rage. The goat charged ferociously at the ram and struck him, breaking off both of his horns. Now the ram was helpless, and the goat knocked him down and trampled him. No one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. The goat became very powerful, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in the large horn's place grew four prominent horns pointing in the four directions of the earth. Now, remember in the vision from chapter 7, there was this leopard with four heads. So we can kind of guess going into it, like uh, Daniel already now kind of understands with that other vision, it may be maybe the same thing as we have this, this goat now with this really large, powerful horn, and then in its place grow for others. Maybe we're talking about the same thing. And sure enough, if that's what you're guessing, you'd be right. Daniel goes and he asks God for help understanding this vision. And God sends, get this, he sends the angel Gabriel to help him understand what he just saw. So Gabriel shows up to explain this vision to him. So we got a vision, right, of ram with these horns, one longer than the other, very powerful, trampling all sorts of things, taken over, and then all of a sudden this goat comes in and tramples the ram. That's the vision. And what, we, what we're gonna find out from Gabriel as you read chapter eight is that the horned ram, again, represents the Medo-Persian empire. Even the intricacy of the detail of this vision, that has two horns, but one is longer than the other. You see, the Medo part of the Medo-Persian Empire was actually bigger and more powerful than the Persia part of the Medo-Persian Empire. In fact, the, it also says that the, though the other one, the shorter one, was there longer, that the Persian Empire was there longer. So all this is kind of fulfilled in the Medo-Persian Empire. But none of this has happened to Daniel yet. Daniel is still under a Babylonian king. And he gets a vision about another kingdom that's going to come in and take over, and Gabriel's explaining this to him. And then we have this male goat. The male goat represents this Greek or Grecian empire. And remember what we were saying is that Alexander the Great, one thing about him is that he was so powerful and he took over such an incredible amount of territory in such a quick pace that we call him Alexander the Great. And when he died, like I was saying, he, he split the kingdom into four different parts and gave it to his four generals. Well, this is, what, this is how Gabriel explains what I was just sharing with you. In verse 20 of chapter 8, Gabriel says this, the angel Gabriel says, the two-horned ram represents the king of Media and Persia, and the shaggy male goat represents the king of Greece. And so you can imagine Daniel sitting here thinking, well, all I know is the king of Babylon, so this is something that I, I haven't seen yet. This must be a, a float that's a little bit further down the line. I, I, what are we talking about? This king of Media and Persia? What's that? This king of Greece? What, what's that about? And yet he gets this picture ahead of time. And he says, the large horn between his eyes represents the first king of the Greek empire. We now know that's Alexander the Great. The four prominent horns that replace the one large horn show that the Greek empire will break into four kingdoms, but none as great as Alexander the Great's United Kingdom. You see, one other thing I want you to understand is as, he, as uh, Gabriel continues to explain this, is one of those generals, and remember there's four generals now and they each get a little piece. One of them is uh, the, the, the Seleucid king. The reason we call that Seleucid kingdom, his name was Seleucus. And the, the general named Seleucus, he got this piece of land that was north of Israel and stretched all the way down into Israel. So his kingdom that he got from Alexander the Great really had Israel kind of wrapped up in it. And there's an, another king that we're going to hear about from the south that got Egypt, and we're going to hear about him in chapter 11. But keep that in mind. So one of the kings is this guy named Seleucus. And we actually now know about this next little bit of prophecy, Daniel chapter 8 verse 9, it says this. Then from one of the prominent horns, remember there's now four horns, from one of the prominent horns came a small horn whose power grew very great. It extended towards the south and the east and toward the glorious land of Israel. 
So we now know that this is one of those Seleucid kings. In fact, the eighth king out of the Seleucid Empire was this guy named Antiochus IV. In fact, you want to know what Antiochus IV called himself was Antiochus Epiphanes, which means God made manifest. This guy thought he was so cool and he hated the Jewish people because the Jewish people worshipped some other god the one true God. And so when the Antiochus Epiphanes arrives on the scene, he's like, listen, I am God manifest to man. And therefore, he hated the Jewish people. And so this this one horn that grows out of these four horns, we now know as Antiochus IV, this guy hated Jewish people so much that he, he sacrificed a pig, which is very not kosher, on God's altar. He took the blood from this sacrifice and sprinkled it all over the temple I mean, he commanded that all Sabbaths and all circumcisions be ceased. He also killed uh, over 80,000 Jews and sold another 40,000 as slaves. I mean, this guy was not not a good guy, Antiochus IV. But here's the point. We see all of this. Uh, Daniel receives a vision, and then we see all of it happen. We can now look back in the history books and see how it's been fulfilled with incredible intricacy, exactly how God said it would as he revealed it to Daniel. It's amazing to see this. In fact, here's, here's my first takeaway. If you're taking notes, you want to fill in those blanks. Number one, I don't know about you. Do you guys ever get fill in the blanks and you like to try to guess them beforehand? Anybody do that? Be real. You've already filled in the blank, haven't you? The first one's pretty easy. God has a plan for your life. Write that down. If you read Daniel chapter 7 and you read Daniel chapter 8 and you see this incredible God who already has a plan, if you look at it, really, uh, we're standing at one place in the parade, but God is in a helicopter, okay? He's outside of time and he can see the mares float. He can see the, the band from the high school. He can see it all at once because he's outside of time. In fact, I want to in- share something with you that might kind of you know, break your brain, okay? All of us that are followers of Jesus, we kind of get, uh, we know it's supernatural, but we kind of understand the concept of God being everywhere. Don't we understand that, right? We know that God is here right now, and we also can, can grasp the concept that he's also in new church plants in the Dominican Republic. Right now, he's there. God is everywhere, and we're like, yeah, I can get behind that. But do you know that God is also every when? You probably are like, I've never heard that word before. But if God is outside of time, here's what that means, is that God is equally at creation right now as he is in 2023, as much as he is at the end times when he puts everything back to the way it's supposed to be. God is at all times, at all, at all times, because he is outside of time. So God is like in that helicopter looking at the parade. There isn't a part of the parade that's going to surprise him. And here the cool thing about that is we have the freedom, like we already, God gives us the freedom to decide what we're going to do in our life. We get to walk out of here and decide where we're going to go get lunch or if we're going to go home and what we're going to make. We have a lot of freedom to choose things on our own, but God is outside of time and he already knows exactly what you're going to do. He already is outside of that and then already knows exactly, and here's the point, is that God, before creation even happened, He already knew about you. He already had a plan for your life. He already knew exactly what you're going to do with that plan. He knows whether or not you're living in your purpose or outside of the purpose he has for you. But regardless of what you choose to do, he's going to take it and use it for his good. That's one thing we know about God. We see that in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. God is outside of the parade. He's looking down from above. He understands how everything fits together. That's what I hope you would gather from those two chapters. Let's go into chapter 9 together. Chapter 9 of Daniel is one of the most powerful uh, examples of prophecy in the Old Testament. It's an incredible turning point. It's a milestone chapter in the Bible. There's something incredible that's going to happen in chapter 9, and I don't want you to miss it. So now we're at a point in Daniel's life where Remember, uh, he was under a Babylonian kings in, in his early life. He got taken out of Jerusalem when he was a teenager. And now there's now a, 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 media, a Medo-Persian king 
uh, over, over, the, over Daniel. All right, so now he's in his 80s. And, and Daniel knows that he was, he was told that there would be a 70-year period where Jerusalem and all of its inhabitants was basically destroyed. The people were taken into exile by the Babylonian king. And there would be about a 70-year period that this was going to happen. So what Daniel's doing right now, he was taken out of Jerusalem as a teenager, and now he's in his 80s. So what do you think he's doing? He's doing some math in his head. He's saying, wait, 70 years? That's like, that's like soon. We're supposed to be able to go back to Jerusalem soon, rebuild Jerusalem any day now. So he goes to God, and he prays, and he says, God, will you help me understand the timeline? When are we supposed to go back? What is that going to look like? Would you help me understand? And then God sends the angel Gabriel again in that moment to answer his prayer. And let's read that together. Let's uh, look at 9 verse 20. Daniel says, I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. And as I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment, don't, don't, man, listen to this. The moment you began praying, The moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I am here to tell you what it was. For you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. Here's a second takeaway. I hope you don't miss this takeaway. Takeaway number two is you do not have to make an appointment with God. He is listening right now. Daniel, he, he, he does the math in his head. He knows it's time to start thinking about possibly his people returning to Jerusalem, rebuilding the, the temple, all that good stuff. And so he prays, and it says, in that moment, Gabriel says, listen, the moment you began praying, God sent a, gave me a command to give to you. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but there's so many people in this world. There are like eight billion people on this planet. And we're thinking, man, especially on Sundays, God's phone line must get really clogged up with us giving out, you know, prayer requests and praying to him. You know, here we are praying over communion, and there's a bunch of other churches doing the same thing. God must be like, whoa, hold on. Just leave a message. I'll get back to you. But the truth is, we don't need to make an appointment. When we pray to God, we're not leaving a message. He's paying attention right then and right there, because Daniel prays. And here's what Gabriel says to him. God gave a command right then. He says, because you are very precious to God. Well, I got a word of encouragement for each of you in this room. You are very precious to God. And when you pray, God listens. God's listening to your prayers. You don't have to make an appointment with him. You can talk to him. So Gabriel is talking about this vision, but he hasn't really shared the the meaning yet or given the vision. So let me, in Daniel 9, if we keep reading, starting in verse 24, things are about to get really confusing, all right? So bear with me, and I'll try to help us understand what we're reading. It says, a period of 70 sets of seven. Anybody else not really a big fan of math? Like, just do the math for me, right? All right, all right. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. And then Gabriel says this, now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven, will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing, and a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city of the temple. So Daniel must be as confused as you and I are right now. Like, what does this mean? There's going to be this 
seven sets of seven, and then the 62 sets of seven, and then, and then, uh, and all that is going to start as soon as the command to rebuild Jerusalem starts, which should happen any day now, Daniel's thinking. That command is coming any moment, and as soon as that command is given, then we got this period of time plus this other period of time, and then the anointed one is going to enter Jerusalem. You know what? We now look, Daniel, again, these are floats that haven't come by Daniel's parade line yet. But these are things we can now look back and know exactly with incredible precision. You want to hear how precise this vision was? Well, you take 62 sets of seven, and before we even do that math, let me share with you. We know exactly, remember, this command is supposed to start the day that the command is given to go rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, to rebuild Jerusalem and its walls and all that. And we know from going to Nehemiah that Nehemiah, remember, he went in to the king and the king gave him a command. We know exactly when that was because Nehemiah chapter 2 tells us in detail. Uh, just bear with me for a second. It says, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, in the month of Nisan, on the first day. Why do you think the Bible gives us that kind of detail? Because you know what you and I can do with that kind of detail? We can actually go back and convert the calendar and actually know that the command to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple was given on a very specific day. It was March 14th, 445 BC. March 14th, 445 BC. Okay, well, what do we do with that? We also know with incredible precision, you go back in the history books and understand, uh, we know the day of the triumphant entry of Jesus riding on a donkey, coming into Jerusalem as essentially the new king. We know what day that happened as well. That was April 6th, 32 AD. April 6th, 32 AD. Bear with me. You're thinking, why, why do we care about any of this history lesson? Well, I'll, I'll share why. Well, Daniel's given a vision he says there are going to be 62 sets of seven plus seven sets of seven, and we now know that these are years, and you, you kind of do that math out, and what you have is 483 years, and if you do that math out even further, and you take out leap days and all those things, you have a, a 173,880 days. Daniel is told that from the moment that, that there's a command given to rebuild Jerusalem, there's going to be this period of 173,880 days, and then the king is going to enter Jerusalem fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, riding on a donkey. Well, a bunch of people have done the math. They figured out, let's take the calendar. Let's just go, all right. We got, we got uh, March 14th, all right, March 15th, all right, March 16th, and she did the math out, and guess what happens if you take March 14th, 445 BC, add to it 173,880 days, you get March 6th, 32 AD to the T. You see, Daniel, someone didn't just run up and say, Daniel, the float that's coming, it's incredible. They, they, they explained it with detail. They said the float has this and it has that and all these little intricacies. And Daniel knew exactly the day that Jesus, and when you read the New Testament and you hear about Jesus saying, listen, the time has arrived, you know, Jesus is like, all right, listen, my father made a, uh, said, to told Daniel exactly when the day is and that day is coming tomorrow. I got to do some things. Man, the Bible is full of things like this. It's an incredible source of recognizing that God knows exactly. He's in that helicopter looking at the parade before anything ever happens. And then if you keep reading in Daniel chapter 9, remember that second part of verse 26. It says this. It says, The anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. We know that as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, everyone's expecting this, this finally, the king that we've been waiting for, someone's going to take over, uh, we get this, this kingdom back, it's finally ours again, Jesus enters in, and then he's going to get killed, and people are going to look back and think, what? that's not what we were expecting at all. Daniel knew all about this. I mean, it's almost like, why wasn't someone standing there that day saying, listen, we did the math, we know the day is the day the king's coming. Daniel knew all about it because God's word is so incredibly precise and accurate and true. We gotta, we gotta move faster. <laughs> Chapter 10. 
Here's, here's your chapter 10 overview. You ready for a real quick one? Chapter 10 is a, a setup, if you will, for chapters 11 and 12, all right? It's your little introduction into chapters 11 and 12, a bunch more prophecy, and it kind of all points back to 11 and 12. So that's chapter 10. Go back and read it on your own. Chapter 11. No. Chapter 11. In chapter 11, you're going to read 135 prophecies. And these prophecies are about the king of the north. Remember that Seleucid king? And the, the, one of the generals was Seleucus. And then another one of the generals, the one that's in charge of Egypt. And these two kings are king from the north and the king from the south. Chapter 11 talks about how these guys and their, their following kings, they're all going to fight each other back and forth. 135 prophecies prophecies about the north. The king from the north is going to do this, and the king from the south is going to retaliate and do this, and the king from the north is going to do this. And it talks about these things, and, and all these things have already been fulfilled with incredible precision. How amazing is that? 135 of them. You go back and you study history, and you can see that this is what happened. This is what they did. But the, the last part of Daniel chapter 11, I would say probably verses 36 through 45. Many people believe, and I'm one of them, that this is a part of, of prophecy where we're, we're now looking at a piece of the parade that hasn't come in front of us yet. This is a, about end times. We're now looking at ahead to a part where all, all these things uh, have, uh, for the most part, have already happened. We've already seen the float go by but the last part of Daniel chapter 11 is where we start looking ahead into the future about things that you and I haven't experienced yet. But let me tell you what. If you just experienced in just one chapter 135 prophecies fulfilled with incredible precision, exactly how God said they were going to, and then he gave you another prophecy that hasn't happened in your life yet, can you count on it? Yeah, you can. Listen, if someone gave me 135 days in a row, the winning lottery numbers, and they said them to me, and I'm like, no, nah, I don't do the lotto. And then the next day, those were the winning numbers. And the next day, they're like, here's the numbers. I'm like, I don't, I don't play the lotto. 135 days go by like this? I'm playing the lottery on day 136. <laughs> and I'm keeping those numbers myself. Here, here's a takeaway that we can gather these kings and sin nature. You see all this, this stuff fighting back and forth. Here's takeaway number three, is that sin nature makes humans act like beasts. But God is in the business of confronting beasts and rescuing his people. That's one of the things that I hope as you read you know, chapters nine and uh, seven and eight and nine and 10 and 11 even, you're, you're just recognizing that God recognizes that our sin nature makes us act like animals, but God is in the, the business of confronting our sin nature and rescuing his people over and over and over again. Here's chapter 12. The, the minute I have left. Chapter 12 overview. Now chapter 12 is a part of the parade that none of us have seen yet. We're all kind of too far uh, to, towards the front end of the line that the, the end times parade float hasn't come in front of us yet, all right? So chapter 12 are about things that are to come in the end times. And so I want to share with you a part of, of this vision. Daniel chapter 12, the first two verses. It says, at that time, Michael, the archangel, so now he's already now met Gabriel, and now he gets to, we're hearing about Michael, the archangel, who stands guard over your nation. How cool is it? He's got Michael, the archangel, specifically watching over Daniel's nation. Anyway, will arise. And it says this, then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those bodies, many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Again, 
All the fulfillment of prophecy happening exactly the way Daniel said it would be. And one of the gifts that we have is now that we see that God, when he says something is gonna happen, it's gonna happen, and we can count on it. So when we look at chapter 12 and it says, listen, uh, there's gonna be a time coming, and it's gonna be really, really painful, but don't worry, because God's gonna rescue his people, and some, their, their bodies, whether you're, you, I don't know, you're still living at that moment or not, but bodies will be raised up out of the ground, and some will be raised to everlasting life. By the way, first time, The concept of everlasting life is mentioned in scripture. A race to everlasting life and the rest to everlasting shame and disgrace. So we know that 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 everlasting life, that we we have an opportunity to, through Christ, to be restored into right relationship with him and we get to enjoy everlasting peace and love and relationship with God and other believers in a real place called heaven. The Bible makes this clear of what's going to happen in the end times. We get to see it. It hasn't happened yet, but there's also a real place called hell. And and Daniel gets to share with us that there's this everlasting experience, and some people are going to go to life, and some are going to go to death and disgrace. Here's your last takeaway, given light of that, and you're going to hear this in verse 3. Here's your last takeaway this morning, is a wise person leads people to Christ. A wise person leads people to Christ. Verses three through four say it this way. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end when many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. So I want to remind you that a wise person recognizes that even in a room like this, some of us will be raised to everlasting life. Some of us will experience everlasting death and disgrace. And the reason that separates that is simply the person of Jesus. What do you do about the question of Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is who Jesus claimed to be? Have you made him the Lord of your life? You know, Hudson just this morning. It was amazing to to see you made a decision to follow Christ and then you took that initial step of obedience in the waters of baptism. I know that when that final day comes, when this prophecy is fulfilled, I know what side of the line Hudson's going to be on. I know where I'm going to be. You know, I'm I'm doing my best to lead my family. I know where my wife and my kids are going to be. But man, it's it's a question that each of us, we got to ask that question and, and process through it, but a wise person wants to invite other people into a relationship with Jesus. So what do we do with this? As we always ask that question, what now, God? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you need to give your life to Christ, that's the obvious always first step in faith, to start the walk, to start the relationship, to give your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, one day I want to make sure that when this everlasting moment of uh, what, what happens after the natural world, that I'm forever existing with you in life. And for some of you, uh, another thing I want to ask you to consider is go back and read Daniel chapter 7 through 12. We didn't get to read uh, very many of the verses, so go back and look at it. Maybe you want to keep reading. You could read in Ezra. Ezra is like Daniel part two. You get to kind of hear what happens after. You get to go and read Nehemiah. You get to hear where Nehemiah gets the command at that 70 year mark to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple. You get to, man, you even wonder like, where does Esther fit into all this? You know, Esther married one of those media, uh, media Persian kings. And so even all these timelines in the Old Testament, they, a lot of them overlap in a really cool way. You can see how the whole story unfolds. So what I'm encouraging to do when we ask this question, what now, God? Man, fall in love with this book because when you read it and you study it and you learn these things and see how it all fits together, it's amazing to see that God does what he says he's gonna do. You can count on it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing so much about who you are to us in your word. You've given us exactly what we need to know everything you want us to know. There's so much more about you we could know, but you've given us exactly what you want us to know. And you continue to reveal stuff to us through your Holy Spirit. But Father, we are just thankful for this this book of Daniel that you've given to us. Thank you for these last uh, weeks that we've been able to go through it together and understand how we as a church can thrive in our version of Babylon. 
We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday morning. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.